Uh, December 1st starts a new season of Advent of Code and I've been loving this challenge for years. Something I always do is have a base class that lets me just get right into coding, not having to worry about acquiring the challenge input. To do this, you have to self-authenticate to the site with your session and then grab the input. To do so, you need the session token. Well, the session token is part of a secure cookie. As you can see here, here's the session and it's secure. So what you could do is just copy this value, put it into a text file and then download your inputs that way. But that will be way too easy. I like to do it programmatically. So a few years ago, I coded something to actually do this while Chrome was running. So I write, uh, wrote some code to make an NTFS uh, shadow volume copy of the Chrome data so that you can get a snapshot of the data while the process is running and would normally lock you out, which is pretty cool if I say so myself. And then I would proceed to decrypt uh, the Chrome secure cookie, which has uh, some layers of protection. So when it was nearly advent of code time again, I thought, okay, let's revisit that, see if everything works. As you can see, I'm logged in now, but when I logged into the, uh, opened the site before, I wasn't logged in. So I figured, okay, let's log in and then <clears throat> grab a new session key so that we can go on for another year. But my code didn't work. I was like, huh, what happened? And the first thing I noticed was that the marker inside the cookie that gives you uh, their encryption standard, like their versioning, that used to be v10, it now returned v20, which gave me a clue as to what was going on. So there's a security blog here. And basically they had an issue where uh, naughty software would grab all your secure cookies and do evil things with them. Uh, so they changed their authentication scheme as they laid out here. I'll put a link in the video description. Um, so what they did, they added just many, many layers and make it a lot harder to decrypt the data. Uh, there are already workarounds that I've seen, but none uh, that, that actually take advantage of the debug ports. <clears throat> so they launch Chrome with, uh, uh, with the debugger and then send them commands to just pull out all the cookies. Uh, but I like to do things the hard way. <laughs> um, so yeah, what I did was I, I altered all my code <clears throat> uh, and after seeing how everything works, uh, I had a multi-layered approach. So what I did was I started a program. Maybe I should explain a bit how the, the encryption works now. Uh, so in, in the old times you had your, um, your cookie file, which is basically an SQLite database. Uh, it would have entries and then you could use DPD API um, with, uh, with, which decrypts the data uh, using integrated Windows stuff tied to your user account. Uh, so it's really friendly, pretty secure, but yeah, it, it gives basically everyone that can call that function the option to decrypt the data. So if you have local execution, it's game over. Um, <clears throat> to work around that or to make it harder, they added multiple layers now. So what they did is um, they still have that step of using the API to encry encrypt and decrypt the data, but there are m multiple layers in front of it. <clears throat> One of the things they did was to uh, do that same encryption step, but use it, do it as a system account. So you need to run a system to be able to <laughs> encrypt or decrypt that. So they have a separate process to do that. Um, in case you're not familiar with it, running a system privileges. When you start a process, you have certain privileges. You run as your local user, as administrator, or a system, or whatever. There's no real way to change that for a running process. The only thing you can do is to launch a new process with different uh, privileges. So what I need to do was have multiple applications running as different identities and communicate with each other. So basically, I wrote my own malware, <laughs> sort of. Um, so what I did was, and this is just, it, it's not fully fledged, it's not weaponized, it's just simple for advent of code stuff right now, though it basically becomes like uh, my own baby malware, uh, but I'm not evil, so don't worry. <laughs> but yeah, the, the approach that I took um, for like, th there's, there's multiple ways to do inter-process communication. I figured I'd leverage uh, a standard that I really like in .NET, which is basically to spin up a little web server and use WebSocket for bi-directional communication. 
uh, it's really easy you can uh, tap into it uh, it means it would work even if the it's not on the same machine you could connect it over the internet <laughs> there comes the malware angle again but no uh, it, it's, it's just an easy way to do stuff for me so what I did was I uh, wrote a console program that launches a signal R WebSocket server um, I made sure to add a manifest so that it would launch itself at, as an administrator because that is required for some of the stuff that we're about to do. Um, and that, that is basically the, the controller that communicates with other stuff. So let me show you some code or at least the, um, the way I worked it out. Um, here, by the way, the example that once you have the uh, session file, which is here, it just reads in a session.txt and expects it to have the session key there. Um, this base class will basically make sure that there is a solution for every day. So if you uh, set this to day one in your uh, super class, or if you just knew it up here, um, it will try to get day one. It will keep a cache so that you don't hammer it. This is actually required to make sure uh, they don't get their servers overloaded, you need to send the user agent to describe who it is so that they can, can identify the software that executes it. Um, yeah, so basically we have the get Chrome secure cookie program. This has the server hub, as you can see, which is a signal R service. It has an app manifest, which basically says, hey, if you run this, make sure that it's run as administrator. So if you would start this project, run it, and you're not started as an administrator, you would get a warning message. I'll paste it in the video. Um, but normally adding this would be enough, for, but for .NET Core, you need to actually uh, change the project file. So you go to, let me see, there is usually an added project file here. So you need to add this bit here application manifest, app.manifest inside the property group uh, that also has the target framework, etc. <clears throat> if you don't have this here, it will not load the manifest and execute it. So this is just a way to make sure that the application only starts as administrator. Why do we need to start as administrator? Well, that's because we have um, this little helper here. Um, you might be familiar with Windows Tasks. It's a system that's been around forever all the way back to 95 or maybe even before that probably, uh, where you can, it's like Chrome jobs in Linux, right? You can set up some stuff that needs to happen uh, at logon or repeatedly or one shots, whatever. Um, since we need to run something as service, the easiest way to do this uh, as, that I found, please tell me if there's an easier way, is just to create a new scheduled task and launch it once and then clean it up. So basically this creates a new scheduled tasks, make sure to set it to run as system and a service account, and then just add our payload there. Um, so I have, uh, yeah, I just hard coded here. It, it used to be a format string, but uh, yeah. Here we just have the, uh, the executable that we want to run, which is our level two helper. I just called it that. Um, so basically what this does, it sets up a listener and I can show you here it has um, some things here already set up um, I have just a, a simple auth key that I just hard-coded to make sure uh, the applications know that it's talking to another application this can just be generated randomly so don't expect this to be the same all the time <laughs> uh, another thing that I did was have an external controller um, so that it was easier for me to debug stuff, right? If I set everything up to run at once, I would have to set up breaks and check for debuggers to be attached. So what I did, I just started uh, and have everything be able to connect with um, signal R commands. So what I did was a small tester program here. Uh, it asked for the URL that the socket is listening on, uh, a key to authenticate itself. Let me run this and I'll show you what it does. So here we go. You see here the thing called boss key. This is just a random GUID and this is what the application expects to be passed by the controlling application. So this is just another little security measure, but well, it only runs once. But yeah, uh, it's, it's fun to set stuff up in a, in a nice way. 
So what I do here is my tester application. Uh, let me just make this big because there will be a lot of data that gets spit out here. Tester application wants to know which URL it needs to connect to. So it's localhost uh, on port 5004. And I need to pass the signal R hub there. I paste in the boss key. And I can see authentication success on the left side. You can see new connection. Okay, so I have some commands that I can run here. If I press L, it will actually launch and you can see the payload fully executing already. So if you scroll up here, back to what happened. Let me scroll up to the top. Uh, you can see launching, it will spit out my advent of code session cookie and then the input for day one uh, as a proof of concept. So to see that it works. Um, so here is the, the payload side. Um, <clears throat> you can see when I hit the L, helper executable, executable launch the system. It gets a new connection. This is actually the, the program that ran as a service connecting back, identifying with the ID that we saw earlier in code. You can see service account connected. It checks itself if it runs as service. If not, it will kill itself. Um, and it will then proceed to, to do the payload. Like, okay, get the shadow volume copy uh, and do the multiple levels of encryption. Uh, it can send multiple stuff. So it can say stuff like, okay, uh, download a file, send me the raw bytes or execute an SQLite command against that file or decrypt this raw data with your local identity. So it will do this partly on the system level account, partly on the local account that I run here. And you can see all the steps that it does. And it dumps a lot of debug information because I had to check lots of uh, encryption stuff. So you can see here the first step, it takes all this data and it then it decrypts it to this level. And then there are multiple forward steps to do the decryption, etc. All resulting in the single cookie fully decrypted that flashes here. So yeah, that's it. A lot of work, <laughs> a lot of fun. But yeah, I have my, uh, my logic again to just grab the cookie from Chrome without having to kill Chrome uh, and do my advent of code stuff. So I hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye.